So today I'll be talking on this topic, what exactly is SLED. So this talk I gave in uh, national conference in Agra in 2016. So the topics I'll be covering is uh, salient difference between dialysis and filtration, classification and what are the distinct advantages and disadvantages of uh, three types of dialysis, intermittent hemodialysis, SLED and CRRT. And uh, once we look into it, we need to look into the operational characteristics, whether urea kinetics is comparable between these different modalities of dialysis, filter life, small solute and large solute control. So is it as good as other modalities of dialysis, fluid removal and electrolyte control outcome and summary. So when we look at uh, dialysis, uh, what exactly we mean is we basically pass the blood through the dialysis filtrate and dialysate flows counter current to the flow of blood and with, with diffusion so there is elimination of solutes from the blood into the dialysate. So the, the key process in hemodialysis is process of diffusion where there is solute diffusion from high concentration gradient to a low concentration gradient. So this is the principle of hemodialysis. So what do we understand by hemofiltration? Hemofiltration also is similar where you see a flow of blood through the filtrate. So along with the solute removal, in filtration there is a solvent removal. So there is water removal. So there is elimination of solutes and along with solutes there is elimination of solvent or water. And uh, this happens by a process called solvent drag. And uh, the key uh, sort of a principle that uh, influences this movement of water and solutes is the convection. And it uh, helps in purifying albumin and enzymes also. So hemofiltration is removal of solute and water or fluids from the body. Hemodialysis is predominantly involves clearance of solutes. So if you have to look at the analogy, so when we say diffusion which happens in dialysis, it is comparable to a tea bag put in hot water. So when you talk about filtration, it happens by convection where there is removal of water. The analogy is similar to ice or a coffee filter machine. So there are certain key determinants for solute control. So the key determinants is the size and surface area of the dialysis filter or the filter membrane and rate of ultrafiltrate flow, water permeability and transmembrane pressure. So basically the surface area of the dialysis is something that influences the clearance of solutes and the rate at which the ultrafiltrate flow is happening or the blood flow is happening and water permeability and transmembrane. So these are the key determinants of removal of solute and solvents. So when you look at the schematic diagram, so basically from the patient you have the blood which is pumped into the dialysis filter. So in the dialysis filter there is a counter current flow of the dialysate fluid. Then there is diffusion and convection whatever is meant to happen and that is and in ultrafiltration the filtered fluid comes out as effluent or filtrate and the purified blood enters the patient. So when we have to classify, how do we classify renal replacement therapy modalities? So you have two major modalities, intermittent and continuous. In intermittent, you have intermittent hemodialysis, which is the conventional dialysis for chronic kidney disease you would see on a OPD basis. Then you have another modality which is SLED and extended dialysis, so extended duration dialysis. So in continuous you have peritoneal dialysis and you have CRRT, continuous renal replacement therapy. In CRRT you have all these different elements. So which, which basically uh, works on ultra filtration principle and helps in elimination of fluids in a slow way. So you have CAVHD, continuous arterial venous hemodialysis, continuous venovenous hemodialysis. CAVHD is continuous arteriovenous hemodialysis and uh, SCUF is slow continuous ultrafiltration. CVVHD is continuous venovenous hemodialysis. CAVHDF is continuous arteriovenous hemodiafiltration and CVVHDP continuous venovenous hemodiafiltration. So we will not go into details of this. So today we will only talk about the SLED. Okay. 
So slide the full form is slow, low efficiency dialysis. So we'll talk about what it means. So what are the advantages of CRRT? The CRRT, there is a slow removal of solute and the fluid. So basically the key principle in CRRT is the blood flows are kept at a very slow rate and even the dialysate flow is kept at a very slow rate. So there is a slow elimination of volume and fluid and the distinct advantages of CRRT is it provides good hemodynamic stability. So especially in intensive care patients where patients are hypotensive, I think that is where the whole concept of CRRT was embraced because it provides good hemodynamic stability. So the disadvantages of uh, CRRT is the cost. So if you compare the cost of CRRT per session it is $1,602 versus SLED which is 423 and and when you compare it to the intermittent it is much lesser. So that is the sort of a costing which was published in this uh, uh, paper. And the other problem with CRRT is there may be constant interruptions in the continuous sort of a dialysis that happens because of change of the fluid banks that you have to keep doing in between. And in, in CRRT, the other disadvantage is you have to use a lot of heparin to keep the patency of the circuit. Otherwise, the blood clogs the filter and uh, then it leads to, uh, you know, longer interruptions between, uh, with, longer interruption with the dialysis. And the other disadvantage of CRRT is you need more manpower. So you need a dedicated nurse who is there because it is a continuous process. So there cannot be any break in the nursing care. So there is, there needs to be a, 24 hours sort of a shifts that needs to be dedicated to the dialysis. So that's why typically in Australia where we had ICU patients put on CRRT, you will have one nurse who is fully committed to this uh, CRRT machine and you may need an additional nurse to do other things. So it becomes little labor intensive. So what about intermittent hemodialysis is the typical dialysis that we do for patients who come on an OPD basis for chronic kidney disease. The advantages is it removes large volume in a short time. So it removes lot more fluid in less time. Disadvantages is since it removes more fluid in a short time, hemodynamic instability is something that that is troubling and not all patients may tolerate, especially someone with a cardiac problem or who is hemodynamic unstable, they may find it difficult to tolerate. And the solute and fluid control. So we do not, since it is a rapid removal of fluid and solute in a short time, I think having a good control over it becomes problematic. So let's talk about SLED. So SLED is what I would say lies somewhere as a bridge between CRRT and intermittent hemodialysis. So it is a uh, modality which sort of fits in between these two extremes of these procedures. Again here there is slow fluid removal and slow solute control. The key advantages is the cost is less and it is less labor intensive. So you don't need a nurse dedicated to it for 24 hours. So since it can be done intermittently. Disadvantage is maintenance. So what is SLED? Slow, as I said SLED is slow low efficiency dialysis or sustained low efficiency dialysis. And as I said, it is a hybrid between intermittent hemodialysis and continuous renal replacement therapy. So when I say hybrid, SLED can be used as intermittent hemodialysis if hemodynamic stability is good. Or it can be even used as CRRT where you extend the duration of dialysis, it becomes CRRT. So you have this distinct dual advantage of sort of tossing between intermittent hemodialysis and continuous renal replacement therapy. So this whole concept of SLED came in 1999 and as I said the filtrate removal is much at a slower rate and it is having good efficiency in solute removal as well. And it is little longer than intermittent hemodialysis and it can be given in an intermittent way. The typical duration for SLED is defined as 8 to 12 hours and it needs to be given 5 to 7 days per week as and customized to the patient needs. And you have filters which are adaptable for SLED. So what are the technical consideration when administrating SLED? So as I mentioned, dialysate flows counter current to the blood. When I say counter current, blood flows in one direction, dialysate flows in one direction and diffusion happens of solutes and if fluid removal is required, then con with convection principle, fluid removal is removed. So it is a low flow of dialysate. So dialysate flows at a rate 
which is at a much lower rate than intermittent hemodialysis. So because of this there is low solute clearance and low ultrafiltrate rate. And when I say it is hybrid, you can prolong this. As I mentioned, typically it will be for eight, 6 to 8 hours. You can prolong it up to 12 or even up to 18 hours. And it's a continuous process. And SLED is sort of uh, suggested that it is easy to use because you have a touch screen and it is easy to manipulate uh, the settings. And it has a compatibility, as I mentioned, to alternate. You can use it as intermittent hemodialysis or you can use it as a SLED. So what about dialysate, what you use? So there is a continuum, continuous sort of preparation of dialysis where you have an inline preparation of dialysate. So where you have an RO water, so in one sort of a tubing you have electrolytes and acid, in a second sort of a tubing you have bicarbonate, both get mixed and dialysis fluid is prepared. But typically what generally is used is this canisters. So you have these canisters which last for one treatment or it lasts for 16 to 17 hours of dialysis if you use it at 100 ml. But if you use it with a high dialysis rate, it lasts for 5 to 6 hours if you use it at 300 ml per hour. So this canister lasts for one sled. So most uh, tertiary referral hospitals will have inline preparation. So generally the typical dialysis unit will have an inline preparation of this dialysis fluid. But if it is uh, in any other place, the canisters would be used. The typical composition of this dialysate is bicarbonate, it contains bicarbonate 28 to 32 milli equivalents per liter, potassium of 3 milli equivalents, calcium 1.5 to 2.5 milli equivalents per liter. If you are planning to give sled for more than 8 hours, then what is recommended is using a higher potassium bath and lower bicarbonate in the dialysis fluid. So that is the recommendation. And what is dialysate flow? So I think your key element in determining the solute and solvent re uh, removal depends upon the flow of dialysis which is called QD. So basically dialysate flow is governed by your tolerance to your ultrafiltrate removal and hemodynamic, hemodynamic stability because if you are very hemodynamically unstable then you would slow down the dialysis rate. If they are hemodynamically very stable you may increase the dialysate flow rate and when you say increase the dialysate flow rate there is improvement, there is more ability to remove more fluid and more solutes at a faster rate that's, that's what it means so when there is a good tolerance to ultrafiltrate removal when there is a good hemodynamic stability what it means is you can give dialysate you can increase the dialysate flow so that your duration of dialysis becomes shorter so you can increase the flow 300 ml per hour then it lasts for 6 to 10 hours if they are unable to tolerate fluid removal then you have to give longer duration so you slow down the dialysis flow rate at 100 to 200 ml then you have to prolong your duration. So higher the flow rate, lesser is the duration. So lesser the flow rate, higher is the duration because you need that much time to clear the solutes. That's what it means. And anticoagulation is needed for both of them uh, because 40% of the times in sled, the advantage is you may not need heparin. And typically if you use heparin, 1000 to 2000 units bolus is given at 500 to 1000 units per hour to maintain APTT 1.5 times the normal. So typically the mean requirement for heparin during sled is 4000 to 10000 units per treatment and it is found to be 50 to 75 percent less use of heparin when compared to CRT. So that is a distinct advantage of sled because that's why people are moving more towards. When I was in Australia we were using only CRRT but the problem with CRRT is you use more heparin so there is more risk of bleeding from the venipuncture sites. And there is more problem with platelets dropping because of uh, heparin induced thrombosis. So these things can be averted or mitigated by sled. When there is a hits, the suggestion is to use direct thrombin inhibitor. So it is recommended they use ergotroban at 250 micrograms per kg as bolus followed by 2 micrograms per kg per minute as infusion. If patient develop heparin induced thrombocytopenia, then they are on sled. So let's look into the operational characteristics of urea kinetics. So as you see, if you see this graph, this graph typically shows linear correlation of your urea clearance which is very linearly correlated to the dialysate flow. So if your dialysate flow is 50 ml per minute, as you see your urea clearance is less. As your dialysate flow keeps increasing, your urea clearance also proportionately increases. So this is what something we need to understand that your urea clearance and solute removal is directly dependent on the dialysate flow. And what about uh, the urine's 
urea clearance or the filter replacement. So you, we need to understand when we need to replace the filter. So that is determined by this ratio. So this is uh, urea dialysis, dialysate urea nitrogen. So you basically measure urea in the dialysate divided by blood urea nitrogen into the dash dialysate flow. If this is less than 60%, then it is time that you have to replace the filter. So this is the test to determine when the dialysis filter has to be changed. So this was a study uh, where they looked at what is this clearance. As you see, uh, in 9 patients, they looked at dialysate urea nitrogen divided by blood urea. Even after sled of 12 hours, I think they did not need filter replacement. So which means it had a good efficiency in removing solutes up to 12 hours, but still filter is not decayed, which means filter was still effective in removing the solutes. That's what it means. Again, this graph again shows uh, your sort of a clearance uh, and, the, and the duration of dialysis frequency per week. As you see, if you give more dialysis, your blood urea, your ability to reduce blood urea increases. So if you give around 2 to 3 dialysis, uh, you can maintain blood urea less than 100. So if you maintain 3 to 4, less than 80. So again, there is a linear correlation between the number of dialysis per week and your ability to clear the urea. So, so what about small solutes? So we looked at the urea clearance which had a linear correlation with the dialysate flow and with the number of dialysis per week. What about small solute control? So this was a study where they looked at sled being done three times per week and they compared with CRRT where CRRT is a continuous process. They found metabolic control was similar between the sled and CRRT group and urea disequilibrium was minimal. And as you see with sled, there was a progressive reduction in the blood urea as well or the metabolic control was much better and there was a progressive reduction with sled. So which again shows that even with small solute control, it was very effective in clearing it. And they looked at large solute control. Again, they compared sled and CRRT because one of the hypotheses is CRRT has an ability to remove cytokines. That's why it was touted as the modality for sepsis that it will remove the cytokines and it will preserve the white cell function. So they found that when they compared sled and CRRT, even sled restored white cell function and cytokine removal was similar between sled and CRRT. And this was a study again to compare between the sled. Sled means only dialysis and dialysis with filtration. When I say filtration, fluid removal and solute removal. This is your only solute control. So they saw that 30 day survival was much better when sled filtration happened as compared to only sled. And here they got treatment for 8 to 16 hours per day and vasopressors were able to be weaned much better in sled filtration. Okay. And recovery of renal function tests happened in 4 of these 8 patients who underwent sled filtration. So again it goes on to show that only solute control may not be the way to go. So in sled along with solute it is always desirable to get fluid removal as well because that was shown to have impact on survival and your ability to wean vasopressors. So we looked at large solute control we saw it is comparable to CRRT, small solute control we saw it is comparable to CRRT. What about fluid removal? So typically sled you could remove up to 0 to 6 liters per treatment but average sort of a recommendation is you can safely remove up to 3 liters per treatment and very small percentage of patients you may have to discontinue due to instability during fluid removal that is 0 to 7 percent. So they looked at CVS instability because the way CRRT is shown as a modality superior to sled is to say that it is more hemodynamically stable but these were two studies which came from US and German group where they found CVS instability was no different between sled and CRRT group. So this was a study done in 39 patients, uh, it's a German study where they did an ultra filter rate of 3 liters in 12 hours and 3.2 liters in 24 hours and compared between sled and CRRT. They found inotrope dose was no different, either you do sled or CRRT uh, when uh, the patients did tolerate up to 3 liters very well without increase in the vasopressor needs and outcomes also were no different and the maximum ultra filtrate removal that was happened that happened in sled was 13 ml per kg hour even as much as 13 ml per kg 
up to 6 liters, if you take as a 60 kg, there was no hemodynamic compromise. So, which goes on to show that sled vis a vis CRRT is as good in terms of maintaining good hemodynamic stability. Okay. So, let us look into some of the problems one can find with sled. So, some of the problems that are touted is that are touted is uh, so these are some of the institutes where they found there can be a problem with alkalosis. So, with alkalosis, the suggestion, the solution they gave is to reduce bicarbonate concentration in the dialysate fluid. This was another university hospital where they found there can be phosphate loss about 1.5 to 0.6 grams. And the solution for that they suggested is you have to supplement phosphate if there is a phosphate loss. And with regards to citrate anticoagulation, there can be citrate accumulation with sled. So, the solution for that is to increase the dialysate flow to eliminate the citrate. And with sled, I think it has been suggested there can be a lot of amino acid removal or protein loss. So, there they suggest that you have to increase your protein load in the diet by 0.2 grams per kg per day. And drug clearance is considerable, so uh, dosing adjustments may have to be done. So, these are some of the solutions that uh, authors have listed when you are having problems with any of these in sled. So, if there is an alkalosis, reduce by carb. So, if there is phosphate you, reduction, you have to add phosphate. So, these are some of the suggestions that authors have made. So, what about outcomes? So, SLED has been found to be safe and effective and this was one study which came from Australian group comparing mortality. They found no difference between SLED and CRRT. This was a sharp study which came from the Belgian group where this was the biggest study in 996 patients they compared SLED and CRRT patients and they found mortality was similar between SLED and CRRT. ICU length of stay and hospital length of stay also was no different between SLED and CRRT. And, uh, but we do not have data about the superiority or non-inferiority of SLED in traumatic brain injury, cardiogenic shock or severe hepatic failure. I think this is an important slide for you to just keep a, have a little look at this slide. This really defines the differences between CRRT, SLED and So, if you look at CRRT, it has to be it's a continuous. It is 7 days, you have to give 24 hours. For sled, it is 5 to 6 days, it is 8 to 12 hours. In intermittent, it is 3 to 5 sessions per week and 4 to 6 hours. You see 24 hours, 8 to 12 and 4 hours. Blood flow in CRT is very slow, 100 to 200. In sled, it is 200 to 300. As I said, in intermittent hemodialysis, the blood flow is at a much higher rate, 350 to 400 ml. So, dialysate flow is very less in CRRT. In sled, it is 300 to 350. In intermittent, you will see the dialysate flow is much higher, 500 to 800 ml per minute. In CRRT, definitely you need heparin or anticoagulation. You cannot do CRRT without heparin. In sled, 40 to 70 percent heparin may not be needed. So, you can still get away by not giving heparin if you have a patient with IC bleed or thrombocytopenia. In intermittent, hemo intermittent hemodialysis, you don't need heparin. So, hemodynamic stability, we went through the literature which showed that sled is as good as CRRT in maintaining good hemodynamic stability. And um, dialysis ordering, I think CRRT in Australia only intensivist is to manage. So, bar nephrologist. For sled, I think we, we are okay with nephrology and the technicians to handle it and we give our inputs with regards to ultrafiltrate removal or the clearance. And intermittent hemodialysis is predominantly nephrologist domain. So, the summary and conclusions, as I said, sled is as good as CRRT and it is advantageous. Uh, it is more advantageous than CRRT with regards to the costing. It is uh, much lesser priced and less labor intensive and less heparin exposure. And uh, patient outcome depends on the function and skills of the technicians handling sled because they need to be, be wary of the nitty gritties about the components and, and the key elements that are determined to, uh, you know, to prescribe the sled. And treatment delivery, we understood from the data we saw, is feasible even in hemodynamically unstable. So, even in hemodynamically unstable, it is safe to use lead and at least the studies have shown no major difference with regards to hemodynamics. And it is suggested that we need to have standard operating process and protocols when, when patients are being instituted the sled. So, we need to have some sort of a protocols uh, to determine, uh, you know, the key elements when patients are on sled. And uh, I think each one of us need to be aware of the technical consideration about, uh, you know, the whole sort of a parameters that uh, need to be determined when patients are on sled 
and we need to be aware of the dialysate fluids used and we need to be aware of the access and ultra filtrate rate removal based on the hemodynamic stability and the filter characteristics. With regards to operational considerations, sled minimum 3 times per week but it can be done every day up to 5 times per week and what is suggested as great strong recommendation is this ratio. The KT by V ratio is the ratio of effectiveness of dialysis. Okay, so the K T is the time and the K is the dialysate sort of a clearance or the dialysate flow and V is the volume of distribution of blood urea. So basically you look at the dialysate re relation to the volume of distribution of the urea in relation to the time. So KT by V ratio of 1.2 is considered safe for sled. And filter replacement, we saw this ratio, dialysate urea nitrogen divided by blood urea nitrogen less than 60%, you know that filter has to be changed or has to be replaced. And as I mentioned with sled, the average fluid removal is up to 3 liters, but you can go up to 6 liters and we saw the studies which did not show huge difference in hemodynamic stability. And there can be electrolyte and nutritional imbalance, so there can be amino acid loss. So the suggestion is to augment your protein intake by 0.2 grams per kg per day. Thank you very much.